always important for us to, as clinicians, to focus on measurable outcomes. We want to see an increase in range of motion, passive range of motion, uh, res you know, resisted range of motion. We want to see an increase in strength, uh, frequency, intensity, duration of activities. Um, but really, the main goal that most patients have is, is returning hope. They, they want to hope to be able to pick up their grandchildren one, one day. They want to hope to be able to return to work full time and not be in too much discomfort or dysfunction. Um, so it's really important to not put your measurable goals onto the patient. It's important to include them, obviously, in a rehab pro pro process. But it, it's really important to ask the patient where they'd like to go. What do you want to do? What, what is your main goal? And the, usually the main goal for patients is to return hope. This is, uh, sticking with the cycle, this is research from uh, Dr. Ape Carrion, a PhD um, out of the United States. Uh, this was presented at the 2018 uh, San Diego Pain Summit. Uh, I would encourage all of you to go to the uh, website for the San Diego Pain Summit purchase all the videos, it will make a huge improvement into your practice and how you communicate terminology that you use, your thoughts, your ideas, your expectations for patients in pain, and it'll help you interact with your patients um, on, a, on a very deep level that will improve your outcomes, to be quite honest. So with Dr. Akarian's research, um, his research showed that the more emotionally that the brain reacts to an initial injury, the more likely that pain will persist after the injury has healed. So we've all had these patients. We've had the, or we currently have these patients that may have had some type of mechanism of injury that happened six months ago, six weeks ago, six years ago. I have patients that had injuries from two decades ago that they're still dealing with uh, chronic pain. And we sort of have to ask ourselves, okay, well, what, what are we doing? Go back to the, you know, the, the third slide. What are we even doing with our manual therapy practice with these patients that have this longstanding chronic pain management sort of dysfunction? And why do they have that? So the research, his research showed that, um, that there are patients that have of pain that resolves and there are patients that have pain that persists. And in the initial stages, so this was a research uh, paper that they, they Research for 55 weeks. I think they actually extended this for three years and, and the results didn't really change that much. But up until about the 30 week point, the pain and discomfort that we feel typically is a peripheral driver. So it's coming from the area that potentially had the mechanism of injury, the sprain, the strain, uh, the surgery, or whatever it is. Um, and that lights up your primary sensory, primary motor cortex. Uh, a little bit about your, uh, it also lights up a little bit about your emotional um, aspects or your insular pathways and somatosensory areas. Um, and at about the 30 weeks, everybody's functioning about the same, the areas in the brain light up. But after about 30 weeks, for those people that it wasn't, it wasn't very emotional, it wasn't too big of an impact in their quality of life, it didn't impact them too much, uh, their thoughts, their beliefs, their expectations were that this was gonna heal. They had a very positive outlook on their rehab. They had uh, a clinician or a, a therapist that was using you know, positive terminology and explanatory models. So after the 30 weeks, that primary sensory, primary motor cortex, insular pathways, they sort of shut off and your patient goes back to a normal way of life. It goes back to um, running, hopping, skipping, jumping. Sorry, I'm just gonna shut my window here. Okay. Um, so after about 30 weeks, their, their life returns to normal. For the patients that have uh, pain that persists, after about 30 weeks, it stops being a peripheral driver and it becomes more of an emotional driver. So with these patients, when their thoughts, their beliefs, their expectations are that, you know, whatever injury they have, it was the worst event of their life. It was completely debilitating. It was devastating. Um, they don't see a life where they can return back to what they were like or similar to what they were like before the injury. It becomes a very emotional driver. And 
these are our patients that are dealing with their pain and discomfort for um, for years, for decades. So when we think about, you know, what are we doing with manual therapy? What are our possibilities? What are our capabilities of manual therapy? We have to recognize sort of what our limitations are. And again, we have to have a referral network of counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, referring back to the general practitioner or the GP um, for appropriate uh, treatment. Um, you know, if someone walked in with an ankle sprain or a cast on or a post fracture, you'd know what to do with it. But if someone walks in with, you know, a, a brain injury, which essentially this is, this is a, this is a minor brain injury, um, then we need to refer out to the appropriate specialists that are, um, are properly trained in order to help with that, help with that. So again, um, we have the research that shows that neurophysiological neuroimaging studies uh, provide evidence for central nervous system reorganization at both the cortical spinal cord and peripheral joint uh, injuries. So again, in thinking about how it switches from a peripheral driver after about 30 weeks to a, to a central driver, we need to recognize that uh, we have some DIMMs and SIMs. So this is a cute little image that I made. Um, sort of a play on dim, dim sum that uh, comes out of, uh, out of Asia. Uh, but um, so DIMS and SIMS. So DIM stands for dangers in me and SIMS stand for safety in me. And it's really important for us to have conversations with our patients to determine what they're feeling anxious about, what they think might be dangerous, um, and also what they think might be, might be safe because their perception is going to change. Um, for example, I had a patient who was uh, a world-class bodybuilder. He was in the gym working out. He was doing bench press and he felt a little pull in the attachment for his pec minor at the coracoid process. So when he was in my office later, he was describing what he was going through and what he was feeling and, and how his shoulder felt and his thoughts, his ideas about what was happening. And I inquired to him about what his graded exercise program was like for returning back to uh, activity for the shoulder and getting back into the bodybuilding and the weightlifting. And he expressed to me that he felt very scared about going back into the gym um, and that it, ha it had been six to eight weeks before he had even lifted a weight. He was very fearful that even just opening a door with his shoulder was going to cause damage, uh, ir ir irreversible damage um, to his shoulders is sort of what the terms that he used. So we know that that's not, that's not correct. And we need to have conversations uh, with the patients about adapting their perceptions of what they think might be dangerous uh, and sort of re-educating them as to what a safe, uh, safe activities are in their life. Uh, this research actually has been being looked at by um, Lerma Mosley and his group uh, down in Australia. Again, this is for the International Association for the Study of Pain. Um, so they're looking at, uh, beyond nociception, the imprecision hypothesis of chronic pain. So it's interesting, the imprecision hypothesis for chronic pain, um, it, it recognizes that non-noxious stimuli become noxious stimuli and that um, pain can be classically conditioned. Any stimulus that resembles the initial occurrence can actually cause pain. So uh, the example that Lorimer Mosley uses in his podcast is that someone gets bitten by a dog and it's a very emotional experience. There's some tissue damage. There's some rehab that has to go along with it. And it's not a very pleasant experience for the patient and it's very painful later on to the rehab experience when that patient is shown just a picture of a cute little puppy that is sleeping uh, all curled up nice and cute and nice and fluffy um, that patient feels pain looking at the dog so it's a non-noxious stimulus the the it's a picture of a dog it's not even a real dog but it's a picture of a dog that's sleeping it's not even a threat it's a potential danger and just by thinking that that is dangerous and having the previous experience, the body will secrete pro-inflammatory pro mediators in through the tissues in order 
to give the patient or the person the, the perspective and the experience of pain. So, um, so it's very interesting, the thoughts, beliefs, and expectations and how they, uh, they impact your, your treatment plans, how they impact your treatments with your patients. We've had a number of patients in our practice that um, you know, typically with, with manual therapy, massage physiotherapy, we place our patient either supine or prone um, when we're working with the tissues. And a lot of the times, depending on how the mechanism of injury occurred, being supine or prone might stimulate a pain response or might stimulate a danger message in the patient and that they might not feel safe in that position. So we have to work with our patients, creating a safe environment, creating a safe uh, position for them in order, to, in order to work with their levels of expectations. Um, so it, it, uh, this is where we take the research and we put it into practice really. So our, our nervous system uh, is there to really protect and serve us, but in a lot of patients, um, we feel that we're being punished, we're being enslaved. You know, what did I do to deserve this? I'm a nice person, I treat everybody really nice, I give everybody hugs, I love everybody, I'm not mean to anybody, why am I being punished for this? Um, so this is the journey that rehab patients are on. What are the first steps that they're, that they're sort of going through and what are our, um, what's our impact and our influence with the patients uh, because a lot of patients they feel like they're walking into a an endless sea of swells and depression and they just feel like they're drowning because they're not in their normal uh, quality of life and they're always going to you know numerous medical appointments they're taking lots of pharmaceuticals they're they're doing all the rehab they're not getting anywhere so we have to think about what our role is as clinicians um, we need to recognize that environment plays a huge role in uh, the comfortability and the thoughts, beliefs, expectations of our patients. So um, when you're setting up your clinic, or even if you're in a clinic right now, I challenge you guys to look around and, and make small little adaptations to the environment. That might be a color change to the paint on the walls. It might be a lighting change where you, um, you don't have overhead halogen or fluorescent lighting, but you use more, um, more dimmable, more relaxing uh, lighting. Uh, so there's, there's lots of different things that you can use. Uh, and lot, you don't spend a lot of money. There's lots of different ways that you can change the environment of the, the waiting room uh, in your practice uh, in order to already start to um, desensitize your patient. Um, you also need to think about the the first lines of contact with that a patient has with your office what is your voicemail message what are your front end staff using for terms and 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 stories and descriptive uh models for for talking with patients uh, it might be great that you don't use the word pain that you incorporate all of the pain signs into your practice and you change the narratives and you change the terminology um, and you're very interactive, very caring with your patient, but then your patient goes up to the front end and, and it just gets ruined by your front end staff asking, you know, how's their shoulder pain? Um, so it can be, it has to be clinic wide that everybody has to be on the same page using the same terminology and have the same understanding of pain science. Um, so uh, this is a typical medical doctor's office in North America. It, it, tends to be very cold, lots of harsh lighting, lots of just random pamphlets put everywhere. Not a very inviting, welcoming uh, environment for patients. Uh, they really feel that they're basically just a number, just waiting to be called. Um, and then this is an example of sort of a more inviting, more relaxing environment. Uh, so really think about that. Our environment is huge for patients. Uh, in our office, to be honest, we have patients that show up into our practice an hour before their appointments in order to relax, to escape the world, to go on vacation, to, um, to come in and sort of desensitize. Um, again, looking at the words that we use, uh, Dr. Stephen Camper is a physician in the United States. Uh, there's been more damage done, to the, done from the word than the scalpel. Uh, sometimes words hurt more are we 
encouraging patients that they have amazing abilities that they can that they can overcome whatever the challenge is or are we sort of promoting that yeah this is this is going to suck this is going to hurt you're going to have to live with this for a long period of time there's, there's so many patients i've had uh, and and being a patient there's so many times that i've heard from other clinicians that you're just going to have to live with this this is just you're always going to have to have pain um, and that's not necessarily the truth uh, that's not what the research shows so there's a lot of words that we don't use anymore and a lot of the, a lot a lot of us that have been practicing for for a long period of time we we were taught these words these were normal words in a normal conversation day in and day out with all of our patients um, so so we don't use bad posture we know that posture is always changing and that there is no bad posture there's just uh, more functional and less functional posture and depending on uh, what we're working with we we want to encourage a more functional posture for example with patients that have ankylosing spondylosis we want to make sure that they have a more of an upright posture because we know that they're going to fuse and and typically they're going to fuse forwards and then they're going to be less functional as they get older so um, these these words we we change uh, we don't talk about rotated pelvises we know that the pelvis has about 0.5 degrees of rotation about one to two millimeters of movement through the SI joints. But that's not to diminish the pain experience that the patient goes through. If the patient has um, discomfort or, or dysfunction within that 0.5 degrees range of motion or within that one to two millimeters of movement, then it needs to be addressed. It's very serious. We need to look at it. Uh, we know that discs don't slip. We know that there is no misalignment. Uh, there's either function or dysfunction. We know that it's an asymmetrical nonlinear feedback system. Um, everybody has some degree of scoliosis. Weakness, is it weakness because there's some type of neurological compression or is it weakness just because they are just, they just haven't worked out? Maybe they might have disuse atrophy, who knows? Um, so a lot of this stuff, we don't use these words any longer. Uh, some alternatives that we do use uh, would be normal age changes, everything appears normal. You know, rather than saying neurological, we say nervous system. Um, rather than saying don't worry, because that sort of implies to the patient that they're, they're negatively worrying about something, we just say that everything will be okay. So we really want to help build the patient up and um, and improve their outlook on, on what their potential future is. We want to try and return hope to them as much as we can. Uh, we have a lot of patients that come to us excuse me, with, with uh, scars. And they think that scars are just the worst thing ever. And they may be scars in various areas of the body from various mechanisms of injury. Some of it's cancer related, some of it's post-surgery, some of it's from you know, compound fractures and so on. So we really want to change the description of what a scar is and uh, scar stands for me personally scar stands for strong capable adaptable and resilient and when we rephrase that back to the patient it changes their perspective it changes their perceptions of what they're capable of doing um, so so i use i use that uh, term quite a bit so again we're sort of taking footsteps with the patient we're recognizing that what we say how we say it what we do with the patient, how we interact with the patient, even just one word, one term with a certain inflection um, can, can pivot a patient either positively or negatively. And we wanna sort of take them away from this journey that they might be on and we wanna take them here, put them on vacation, take them to a nice place, show them a potential outcome that might be better than where they currently are. Uh, so we have the, we have an amazing opportunity. You know, we work with our patients for 30 minutes, an hour, sometimes 90 minutes. Uh, we have 90 minutes of personal one-on-one -on -one time with the patients. So we have an amazing opportunity to influence uh, thoughts, beliefs, expectations of the patients. We can work with the, the musculoskeletal system. Um, there's a lot of different ways uh, to top down and bottom up um, that we can uh, change the pain, discomfort, perceptions of the patients. Uh, we can improve interoception, extraoception, sensory motor function uh, in the room with patients also. Uh, again, the top down, bottom up. So this is, again, this is research. 
uh, can't see what this oh, it's from 2015. Um, so we talk about how using manual therapy, motor learning, uh, peripheral sensory stimulation, which is what physios are great at doing, uh, using electromodalities, and then also using um, top-down influences. So education, patient education, uh, CBT, mindfulness meditation is really important. Motor imagery is really important. Also, the motor imagery is, is having a huge, uh, there's a huge amount of research into that and how that is really benefiting uh, the pain experience or the discomfort experience for patients. And how that, when you use both of them, not one is more important than the other, but when you use both together in a combination with the patient, that you can really make those neuroplastic changes in the patients. Um, so the role of manual therapy is to provide the nervous system with a novel stimulus to help it function more efficiently. We know from the research and from experience that mechanical pain is usually a result of, of a movement deficiency. Um, and that movement suggestions uh, need to be consistent with the anatomy, neurodynamics, and current pain theory. We know that with manual therapy, these are our, our regular outcomes that we, we all acquire with our patients every hour. Um, so we talked about the bio, talked about the psycho. The social aspect, I've thrown exercise into the social aspect because um, you need to find, in, in designing a rehab program to return function with a patient, the research shows that you have better outcomes when you find an activity that is important to the patient, that the patient loves to do, that is fun for the patient. It doesn't need to be a set number of frequency, intensity, duration of uh, sets and reps in the gym. Um, they don't need to be in the gym. Sometimes it's good to be in the gym in order for you to uh, start with your measurable outcomes, look for your frequency, intensity, durations, look for your active range of motions, your resistance training um, outcomes and, and measurements. But really, you got to find what they love to do. Um, you know, if you've got a patient who used to run, but now they've had a hip fracture from something um, and they've been told that they will never run a marathon again, well, maybe we negotiate. And we think, okay, well, you might not run a marathon, but if we could get you running 5K twice a week, if we can incorporate some fun back in your life, if we could find an activity that you love to do, um, you know, would that be something that, you know, the patient would be interested in? And, and they would all rather be doing something that they love to do, that they have fun doing, rather than being in a gym going through X amount of, you know, frequency, intensity, duration, sets and reps. Um, a lot of patients, especially with our elite athletes, um, they, they actually, they use pain as a coping strategy. So uh, the very last sentence, um, second last, last sentence, uh, says, uh, these results suggest a reconsideration of the dominance of cognitively based emotional regulation. We discuss the implications that a benign physical pain, so benign physical pain, so it's going to be some type of discomfort that the patient puts themselves through that they know they aren't going to be damaged by, they aren't going to be hurt by. Uh, so benign physical pain may be a broadly effective under-recognized coping strategy. So, the, so we have a lot of elite patients, uh, elite athletes that are using activity and pain as a coping strategy. And it's not necessarily a physical coping strategy, it's a mental emotional coping strategy. Um, so back to this, uh, we have injuries that, uh, injuries are both connective tissue and neuropsychophysiological neuro dysfunctions. So we need to recognize that. Um, seven effects of treatment. These are just things, I think we're at an hour right now, so I'm almost done. Um, seven effects of treatment. These are the only seven things I look for at the end of a treatment. You can take a screenshot of this. You can take a picture of this uh, with your phones. I have this up on my wall. My patients are now uh, classically trained to only answer these. I look for change, no change, better, worse, better, later, worse, later, no better, no worse. Um, and for uh, typically my patients, they have the top five questions that, they're, that they want to know the answers to. What's wrong with me? How long is it going to take? Um, what can I do as a patient about it? What are you going to do as a clinician to help? And what's it going to cost? And when we think about cost, we're not really thinking about financial cost, but we're also thinking about the cost of time. 
how much time is this going to take away from my work? How much time is this going to take from my life? How much time is this going to take away from my family? Um, you know, they may not have sick leave at work. They may have to work through their rehabilitation process. They may have a large family that they have to take care of. They might be the only one who is earning income in the family. So what's it going to cost? Um, Maya Angelou is, a, uh, is an amazing uh, American down in the States. Uh, and she wrote, people may not remember exactly what you did or what you said, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So that's very important as clinicians is that we want to be aware of how we make people feel when they leave our office. Um, we want to make sure that we empower people. We want to make sure that they leave being educated with uh, current knowledge and understandings and, and terminologies. We want to provide them baby steps, uh, graded exposure programs uh, for rehabilitation. And remember that non-noxious stimuli can sometimes become nox noxious. So um, if we, for, for example, for a greater exercise program, if we wanted to incorporate kettlebell swings into a generalized low back pain rehabilitation program, sometimes just having the kettlebell in the room is noxious enough for the patient to feel discomfort or protective mechanisms in their low back. So your graded exercise program might be that you have the kettlebell in the room, maybe for three or four treatments before you even address that it's in the room or that you, you, you slowly move it closer to where the patient is. Um, so there's, there's a whole, you know, thought process of baby steps that goes along with that. And, and just recognizing that the research shows that, you know, those things are, aren't, those things that are, that are non-noxious, they can become noxious. They can become pain stimulators uh, right away. Um, mindfulness meditation can be done anywhere. It doesn't need to be in a yoga studio. It can be done anywhere at any point in time. We need to remember that we need to find uh, exercise that's fun for the patient. Um, when we were children, we used to go play outside as adults. We now we go and we exercise. So if we can find something that, that the patient loves to play, that'd be awesome. Sleep. There's a lot of research into sleep. People need to sleep more, so we need to be aware of that. And if they're not getting sleep, then we need to uh, refer out appropriately for uh, for that. And then manual therapy. We know that manual therapy is awesome, and it makes huge changes to people um, people's lives. So again, we're changing our our roles as healthcare providers from pathology detectors and correctors to facilitators of recovery. It's important to have your measurable outcomes that you're looking at and and do your differential diagnoses and um, and it's important to the patient that someone investigates into their discomfort and their dysfunction and that they see that and they see you taking an interest in them. It's important to do that. But your focus is always on facilitating recovery. Uh, we talked about this already. We're going to provide the nervous system with the novel stimuli. We're going to treat patients uh, in a safe, ethical manner, uh, psycho psychosocially, cognitively, and physically. And we're going to collaborate to restore normal uh, grace movement and independence. So we're creating change and we're facilitating growth. Um, a quick case study that uh, is important for, for everyone, I think, is to not lose sight of what the, ul the ultimate uh, goal is of you as a clinician, but also the patient. Now, as clinicians, we all have you know, the main goal of returning a patient to a quality of life. We all have um, the, the goal of obtaining measurable outcomes, looking for active range of motion improvements, passive range of motion and feel improvements. Uh, we want to put a patient on a resistance training exercise program to improve their frequency, intensity, duration of, of, uh, of activities. Um, but we also need to remember that structure determines function in a lot of cases. Now in Canada, in British Columbia, and a lot of other parts of the world, we have uh, outdoor activities where people own these um, all-terrain vehicles where they go mountaineering to see the sites and go camping and so on and so forth. Um, but one thing that doesn't get promoted is that there's a lot of injuries that occur. There's a lot of accidents that do happen. And a patient of mine had an accident happen to him. He was all-terrain vehicling. He was out uh, camping with his friends. 
uh, he went over a cliff and fell down a, uh, a 20 meter ravine into, into the, the ravine, into the, the mountain. And he ended up uh, having a combinated fracture to his distal humerus. So we'll let this image sort of set in so you can have a good look at and see what the, what the actual damage has been done to this area. So you can see where the electronod process and the electronod fossa have been, you know, devastatingly deranged. Uh, there's bone fragments that are floating around. This is going to require some surgery. Just a reminder of the normal structure and then the neurological structures that are in this area. We've got your ulnar nerve, radial nerve, musculoskeletal nerve, median nerve, medial lateral epicondyles, and, uh, and ligaments, annular ligaments, radius and ulna. And then from the posterior aspect, again, we've got um, epicondyles, uh, articular capsular uh, tissues, medial lateral ligaments, and then we've got the neurological tissues that innervate all of those tissues. Uh, again, in the book, I've gone through and uh, found the nerve root, the nerve, and the joint tissues, ligamentous tissues that are innervated by those uh, neurological tissues. Uh, the referral patterns for, um, for these areas, so medial and lateral ulnar collateral ligaments, will refer into uh, the red areas shown in the diagram. The uh, radio collateral and annular ligaments will refer into the carpals and sometimes into the thumb, usually along the radius. Interosseous membrane feels like a very deep sensation. It doesn't feel superficial like skin or muscle tissue, but it feels very deep within the bone tissue. So he obviously had to have uh, surgery. So he's got some plates, he's got some pins uh, to correct and to, uh, uh, to sort of try and create a, a stable humerus again. So that was the lateral view. This is the uh, AP view. You can see that there's actually been a nice fracture right down the center of the humerus. So it's going to be affecting the uh, electronic fossa. Um, so this is a really good, a really good surgery. It was awesome. Um, now, with this patient, again, we have measurable outcomes. We have a level of expectation as to what we're going to attempt to try and attain for range of motion with this patient. Uh, this patient, he could not fully extend 180 degrees to his elbow. He could only get to about 160, 150, 160. When we got the x-rays, we sat down with the patient. We educated the patient about the structure, about the limitations that he was going to have and the fact that he would never again acquire 180 degrees of range of motion for extension because the structure wasn't going to allow it. The electronod fossa wasn't as deep as it was pre-injury. It was more shallow. Therefore, he had lost that range of motion structurally. We took that off of the table for an outcome that we were looking for. And now we were looking for acquiring uh, returning him to function as best we could with the, the structural limitations that we have. He wasn't only seeing us for therapy, but he was uh, seeking treatment outside of our office with another clinician who didn't recognize that the structure determined the function. And she had decided that she was going to acquire and focus on her measurable outcomes. She was going to acquire 180 degrees of extension and she did. And the patient came in one day and his arm was the size of his thigh. It was completely just swollen and just. So we inquired to the patient, you know, what happened to your arm? He said, well, I, I went for treatment with the other clinician. They were focused on getting full extension. They got full extension. So we immediately had to call emergency, had to call the ambulance. Uh, he required immediate surgery that same day. Uh, luckily, I had the surgical reports and the surgeon's contact information. So I was able to contact the surgeon right away, get him in for surgery. But she bent the plate not only uh, in sort of three, eight, three ways, and uh, laterally or anterior posteriorly, but she also bent it laterally. So now there is huge, again, derangement from treatment 
just because uh, she wanted to acquire full range of motion. Here's a comparison of um, post-surgery and post-clinician injury when the clinician was too focused on acquiring the measurable outcomes. Uh, this is a pre and post again. Um, so again, the patient required immediate surgery uh, that same day in order to correct the derangement from the clinician. And this is the resulting um, second surgery, which was shouldn't have been required. So you can see that there is um, thicker plates, pins, nuts and bolts that have been uh, put into place in order to stabilize the injury. Um, this was in place for about 18 months and then the patient's body went through a rejection process where it was rejecting the hardware. So he went in for a third surgery in order to have the hardware removed and this is what his humerus looks like now. Um, so he has even less range of motion with uh, extension than he had coming out of the first surgery, instead of having about 150 to 160 degrees, he now has about 120. So um, this is quite devastating for the patient just because the clinician lost sight of what, the, um, of what the goal of the treatment was for the patient. So don't lose sight. Uh, it's important to have measurable outcomes, but it's also very important to recognize what the patient's goals are and to work within your, uh, your bound, boundaries. Uh, so again, um, you can go to ligamentpain.com. You can look at the book. You can look at the uh, pain referral pattern. This is all research-based. It's not anecdotal at all. It is all published, reproducible research. Um, in the book, we talk about what ligaments are made of, different types of pain that we experience, the neuromatrix, the biopsychosocial model that we ran through earlier today. Um, I also look at sclerotomes, see if they're uh, fact or fiction. Uh, I can tell you that they're fiction based on the research. Um, we talk about all the joint neurological innervation charts, and we talk about all the referral patterns that are in there. Um, this is everything that's in the book also. You guys will have access to this. And this is on the ligamentpain.com website. You can go and you can look at this. So, um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here today um, to the Physiotherapy Rehabilitation Academy of Pakistan. Uh, I really greatly appreciate all that you guys are doing uh, and spending the time with me. Uh... Mm -hmm.